Thank you for tuning in to another episode of InRange. This is the first video of many in a series on the channel coming about U.S. Civil War cavalry carbines. At the beginning of the U.S. Civil War, the cavalry had a problem that they had to face, whether it was Union or Confederacy, and that the standard military arm of the time, an 1861 Springfield muzzleloader, or an Enfield, which is loose powder, ball, and a ramrod, was not viable to be used on forces that are mounted on horse. They needed something breech-loading. And so what I have here are the most common breech-loading Civil War cavalry carbines of the time. Now, this goes all the way from 1861 to the end of the war, at 1865, and we're going to have videos in a series about each one of these very specifically, the manual of arms, how they function, etc. What I want to talk today is a brief overview of the most common ones. There were many of them, more than we can actually cover. And then the ammunition that was made to go with them, which was very, very unique and very interesting at the beginning of time when we started to think about this idea of a self-contained cartridge. And there's some interesting approaches to that that are going to be evident as we go through these carbines. But at the beginning of the war, the very beginning of the war, the cavalry didn't have many options. They had revolvers like this, this 1860 Colt with a stock attached to it, firing the standard paper cartridges of the day. They had the hall, the 1819 hall and subsequent revisions of the hall, which I do not have representative here, but it was a breech loading muzzle loader in that you didn't load it from the muzzle, you'd open the breech, pour in powder and loose ball, or ball, close it, musket cap and fire. But it really was a very leaky system and leaked a lot of gas, so it lost velocity, as well as potentially disrupting the shooter's situational awareness during all that smoke and fire, as well as potentially dangerous to the shooter. The most common breech-loading carbine at the beginning of the Civil War for the Union would have been the Sharps. There was the 1859 Sharps. This is an 1863 Sharps. The 1859 had a patch box, but otherwise it was almost the same gun otherwise. And this had three different ways to be loaded. But at the beginning of the war, there were two, which then got better. One was literally loose powder and ball, where you would open the breech, drop in a ball, pour the powder until you'd filled the chamber, close the breech, put on a musket cap, and fire it. There were also paper cartridges, such as this one, which are intentionally longer than the chamber. You would seat them into the chamber. Closing the breech would actually cut the rear of the cartridge off. Some powder would fall out, but that would expose the powder to the spark from the musket cap, place the musket cap, and fire. The problem with that methodology was, of course, an inconsistent powder charge, and it reduced the accuracy of the sharps. They subsequently made linen cartridges that were better and properly chamber length, which then improved the accuracy. But the Sharps itself still had other issues. The Sharps had problems with misfiring and had a complicated fire path for the spark. More to talk about in the video specifically about the Sharps. As well as it was a leaky system as well with gas blowing out, which again, disrupts your situational awareness and can be dangerous to the shooter. Those were really your options in 1861 at the beginning of the war. A lot changed as the war went on, however, and these are the most popular carbines in order at the end of the war. So let's go ahead and go through them briefly, talk about each cartridge, the powder charge and the bullet, and then we'll have upsert other videos that will talk more directly about each one's manual of arms. So by the end of the war, the still most popular cavalry carbine was still the Sharps. It had such a lead at the beginning of the war and continued to be popular and manufactured throughout the war, as well it has the most orders by the Ordnance Department, but it still was the number one issued carbine by the end of the war. However, technology changed dramatically by 1863, and this became the most second popular carbine at the end of the war, or second most issued. Might have been the most popular. This is the Spencer, chambered at one point in 5656, but then 5650 rimfire. This one is the closest to a modern gun that we could think of. It held seven rounds in the chamber, excuse me, in the magazine. Uh, cycling the lever would index and insert one round into the chamber. Cocking the hammer would then fire it. And since it was rim fire primed, it did not require fumbling with a musket cap to charge the gun. This was the most viable and combat effective of the issued breech loading carbines of the war. It had issues as well, which we'll get into when we do more videos about the Spencer. If it malfunctioned or jammed, you were out of luck, um, as well as it was a more difficult system to clean. But the reality is you had seven rounds as fast as you could cycle the action and cock the hammer and fire it without fumbling with musket caps. And, and for good reason, even though this gun did not start getting officially issued until late 1863, 1864, this almost overtook the Spencer in terms of overall issued numbers. So. That tells you that that technology leap was a big one. The third most common carbine and most popular at the time would have been the Burnside. Burnside was a Union general. 
Also the gentleman for whom we get the name Sideburns for now, based on his beard and hairstyle. This was a breech loading carbine with a very unique uh, cartridge that looks like an ice cream cone that would go into the rear, musket cap and fire. Very simple gun. Reason actually very good in terms of gas seal that just not did not leak much gas It retained the velocity of the powder did not disrupt the shooter and was quite reliable with the ex Exception of occasionally having stuck cases, which was a problem But in general this was a very well received gun and this was the third most issued cavalry carbine in the war Fourth most commonly issued gun in the war Would have been the Smith carbine this one's very unusual in that it uses a rubber cartridge, not a brass cartridge case. And that uh, that in itself had some issues that we'll get into more as we talk about this weapon, more specifically in a video about itself. This one opens up, literally breaks open like you would think of a shotgun. A round is inserted, it's closed, a musket cap is put onto the cone, and it is fired. Very well liked by some of the Union forces that were issued this. Others hated it and detested it. And when we get into a video about that, we'll talk more about that. There was another gun, which I do not have here, which would have been the fifth most common, the Star. Also the same manufacturer as the Star Revolver. The Star Revolver used paper cartridges or loose ball and powder, as well as linen cartridges, just like the Spencer. But at one point, the US Ordnance Corps looked at it and decided, well, you know, we don't need to issue special cartridges just for the Star. We can issue the same linen cartridges or paper cartridges that we issued for the Spencer to the Star. The problem was the chamber length was different, and while the star itself did not actually have technical issues of reliability, because the Ordnance Corps issued the wrong ammunition for the star in an effort to reduce the supply chain line for the Spencer and the star, they induced reliability issues in the star, and to those in the field, they did not realize why, but they knew that the star didn't work well, and the star fell out of favor and essentially fell off the charts by 1863. The sixth most common and popular carbine of the war was the Maynard. The Maynard has a cartridge that looks very much like a modern cartridge, however, it is not integrally primed, it still required a musket cap. This is a very simple, lightweight, really diminutive weapon that was quite reliable, well received, and the one that was most prominent within the Confederacy, as they had ordered a number of them before the war broke out. So, this gun served on both sides to a fairly decent extent, and this would have been the sixth most popular car carbine of the entire U.S. Civil War. It's interesting to note, though, that in production numbers, the actual numbers don't exactly match the actual issuance. In terms of issuance, we again have order. Issuance, number one, Sharps. Number two, Spencer. Number three, Burnside. Number four, Smith. Number five, Star, which is not here. Number six, the Maynard. It's a little flipped when you go to production numbers, though. They had made 94,000 Spencers, so this was the most manufactured, but second most issued. They had made 80.5 thousand of the Sharps, however, it was the most issued of the guns. They had made 55 and a half thousand Burnside carbines, again, now the third most issued. They had made 30,000 of the Smith carbines, 25.5 thousand of the Star we don't have here, and 20,000 of the Maynard. So, a little bit different in terms of production numbers, but what you could see is they were ramping up with the Spencer, hadn't quite issued them and replaced the Sharps yet, and the reason was this was going to become the standard cavalry arm if the war had continued past 1865. Well, that's the order of the popularity of the guns and issuance numbers. Let's go ahead and talk about all the cartridges individually and specifically, and you'll see that they all are, for the most part, similarly functional. Okay, so when we talk about what these guns actually fire, they fire a wide variety of ammunition because this was the experimental era of what was going to become the self-contained cartridge. Most personified, in my opinion, in both the 5656, 5650 rimfire Spencer, as well as, of course, the 44 Henry rimfire, which is not here because it was not officially issued. However, it's worth a conversation later. When we talk about the Sharps carbine, however, the Sharps was typically a 52 caliber gun with a 475 grain projectile with 50 grains of black powder with a bullet that moved at approximately 1,100 feet per second. That's the same whether you fired it from a paper cartridge, a linen cartridge, or loose powder and ball. You're going to get similar performance, a 475 grain bullet at around 1,100 feet per second. The Spencer, which we is near the end of the war, 1864 to 65, this is a center fire variant thereof for my purposes, but it would have been rimfire at the time. This is 5650, 
Uh, they originally started in 5656. However, 5656 and 5650 are not like we think of a black powder today. They were actually the cartridge dimensions, not the powder charge. The Spencer was a 52 caliber gun with a 350 grain bullet, approximately 45 grains of black powder at about 1150 feet per second. So a little more, a little less mass than the Sharps, similar velocity. However, seven rounds in a magazine. The Burnside, 54 caliber, 500 grain bullet. Now this is a reload I have made. This is a round ball because it is easier to get cart uh, projectiles in the right dimension for this original gun in round ball. The original had a more conical shape to it. A 500 grain bullet with 65 grains of black powder that moved at about 950 feet per second. The Smith is a rubber cartridge. This is not copper or brass. It is actually not metallic at all. It is literally rubber. And the Smith had a, is a 50 caliber gun with a 360 grain bullet, 50 grain powder charge at around 1,000 feet per second. The Smith had special issues with its cartridge, which we'll get into more when we talk about the Smith more specifically. The Star Carbine was 55 caliber with a 445 grain bullet, 63 grains of powder, moving at around 950 feet per second. The Maynard, this looks very much like a modern cartridge, except it just has a hole in the rear for a flash chamber, or excuse me, a flash hole, for the musket cap to ignite the cartridge. This uh, was a 50 grain weapon, 345 grain bullet, with 45 to 50 grains of black powder moving at around 1,000 feet per second. You're gonna find that all these guns are essentially 50 something caliber, moving a something, a 350 to 500 grain bullet at around 950 to 1,150 feet, 1100 feet per second. Very much the same in terms of ballistic capabilities, even when you downgrade slightly for this Spencer. Didn't really matter. Back in the day, they were looking for big and slow, not small and fast. But it is interesting to note that the manual of arms for most of them is consistently similar, but different. We will go through each of them as we go through each weapon in particular. All of them, with the exception of the Spencer, required this on your belt, which was filled with musket caps. This was your primer. These right here are how you ignited the cartridge. You had to fumble through, pull one out, and put it on the firing cone, and then fire the gun per round chambered. However, all of these were substantially faster than any muzzleloader of the day. You know, guys, if you like this kind of stuff, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Being able to reproduce these, rep these reproduction arms, or excuse me, am this reproduction ammunition, or even in some instances acquire original guns to fire for you in regards to talking about this history is not easy to do, and it's because of Patreon supporters that make that possible. It's also because of Patreon supporters that InRange survives at all, because we're not advertiser-supported advertiser whatsoever. It's completely you, the viewer. If you already are doing it, thank you so much. If you can't, we understand. Please just subscribe to the channel. You can find us uh, multiple distribution points for InRange at InRange.tv and share with your friends. Thanks for watching.